Hello and greetings from Vienna. My name is Anita Grasa and it's my pleasure to present to you today our review paper on deep learning from trajectory data. In this paper, we dive into deep neural networks and in particularly we look at what kind of trajectory data representations are used to train the networks. So we are interested in how trajectory data is used, uh, transformed, um, before it has been given to machine learning uh, experts to train neural networks. My background is in mobility data science and the main motivation uh, for this paper was to, to gain an overview of this domain. Uh, why is this hard? Um, part of the reason why this is hard is because movement data is highly heterogeneous. We might be talking about GPS tracks, we might be talking about social media check-ins, we might be talking about um, mobile phone network uh, call detail records. Uh, all of these fall in the category of movement data, but they have very different characteristics and it would be treated in uh, completely different ways. Also, another challenge is that the terms used in mobility research vary a lot between different scientific fields, for example, between computer science, geographic information science or geography and urban planning. The same terms might be used to describe different things. Different terms might be used to describe the same thing. So searching for papers on a certain topic is hard because of this inconsistency in terminology. Additionally, usually abstracts are very vague. They might describe the problem that is being addressed, but they rarely describe in enough detail how the solution actually looks like. Um, and the data processing steps themselves are usually buried deep in the papers. So it's really hard to determine what kind of movement data is being used to train the model that is presented in a certain publication. The key takeaway message that I want you to remember after this talk is that usually in most cases, even if trajectory data is used in the process, it is very rarely used in its raw form. It's rarely used to directly train the neural network. Instead, what we observe is that the trajectory data is put through a series of data engineering steps um, and processed in, in certain ways. The two main paths are either to create more compact representations of individual trajectories that still describe individual moving objects, or alternatively, the second option is to create aggregations of multiple trajectories. For example, that to then have time series of vectors or graphs or images like the one uh, you can see on the right hand side, so basically a series of images, of course, is a traffic movie in this context. Uh, the one on the right has been used in a data challenge um, where the goal was to uh, forecast traffic volumes, traffic speeds and movement directions um, by training neural networks on these kinds of traffic videos. Let's dive a bit deeper in those different representation types that we encounter. On this first slide, I have listed all the different ways of trajectory representations that still retain information on an individual level. So you can see on the left from top to bottom from the denser trajectory representations to the more sparse ones. Um, in the top, we have papers that deal with dense trajectories, either the raw GPS trajectories, as we might get them from GPS trackers, or slightly resampled and generalized trajectories, but still rather dense. These are only a few papers. Uh, in contrast, the much more popular option is to discretize the trajectories. So instead of having a series of location records, uh, you might turn these raw trajectories, uh, you might discretize them using, for example, a regular grid that could be a square grid, that could be a hexagonal grid, some other Voronoi-based grid, uh, and then you represent the trajectory as a sequence of transitions from one grid cell to the next one. Or you might uh, 
represent trajectories as a sequence of points of interest or stop locations. So trajectories turned into discrete steps from one stop to the next, uh, instead of dealing with all the intermediate uh, location records uh, in the raw trajectories. In the similar category, I've also listed um, the approaches that use location embeddings or location sequence embeddings. Um, as a way to discretize and to reduce the amount of data that is being fed into the neural network. Uh, and on the most extreme end, we have basically trajectory rasterization, turning trajectories into raster images so you can conveniently feed them into the usual neural networks like CNNs. On the second uh, group of trajectory representations, we have aggregate representations on a crowd level. So we are not looking at individual data anymore, but we collect information and we aggregate them together. Uh, quite commonly, this is done using street networks or other similar graphs. So we might have the, the traffic flow on a certain street network edge gra uh, graph edge or the traffic speed on this uh, network edge um, that we use as information to train the model. Uh, in this category, uh, we also have traffic movies. So these are the image sequences, like I showed you two slides earlier. And uh, this category also contains work that deals with origin destination matrices or similar matrices that can be fed, for example, into graph neural networks. Um, to learn really high level representations just of flows between origins and destinations. A complementary way to look at the literature is to identify which use cases are being addressed by the different neural network architectures. And in the paper, you will find this matrix of eight different use cases that are commonly addressed and um, the different neural network architectures that are applied uh, to, to solve these uh, challenges uh, occur occurring in these use cases. Of course, now in this presentation, I will not, able to, not be able to address all of them. So for every use case, I've picked out one or two examples that I want to show you to discuss uh, specifically how the trajectory data, the mobility data is modeled um, for training purposes. So the first use case I want to talk about is location classification. And the example that I want to show you is from Young et al, where they are classifying regions based on the common uh, movement pattern that is observed in that region. They use synthetic data. That means they manually drew some trajectories. They had a data augmentation step that rotated these drawings in multiple different ways. And they converted uh, the trajectories into directional flow images with a resolution of just uh, 10 by 10 pixels. So um, this is one example of um, turning trajectories into images and then feeding them into a convolutional neural network to do a classification task, a location classification task. The second example that I want to show you is for the use case of arrival time prediction. Um, in this case, the trajectory information or the movement information is aggregated on a graph. Um, and it's not aggregated on the plain road graph uh, that we would use for routing purposes, but instead the road network uh, graph edges are subdivided into shorter segments, as you can see in the uh, figure and each of these segments is then modeled as a node for the graph neural network graph and each node has associated the aggregate travel times and speed informations for this segment and this information is then learned by the graph neural network. The third category I want to talk about is traffic volume prediction. This is a very common topic, so there are lots of publications and we have two slides in this presentation for it. The first example that I want to show you is using uh, traffic flow movies. So in this example, we see traffic 
uh, taxi trajectories in Beijing being turned into a raster of um, traffic flow volumes, uh, a rather coarse raster that covers the whole city of Beijing. And you can see for each cell, they have basically a time series of the traffic volumes uh, that they can learn from to predict future traffic volumes in a certain part of the city. The second example that I want to show you for traffic volume prediction uses a completely different approach. In this case, the historical visitation data of point of interest is turned into natural language sentences and fed into NLP models, so into transformers. And these transformers are then used to do traffic volume predictions for future timestamps. So you can see already there are tons of different ways of addressing these topics and everyone is experimenting with tools that they might be familiar with from other domains outside of mobility. So let's go to use case four, which is trajectory prediction and imputation. And here I want to show you an example with rather high uh, density trajectories. So in this case, Mary et al, they use AIS data um, and they generalize these trajectories from AIS data using a context aware piecewise linear segmentation. And then they train an LSDM model on uh, always three vertices at a time. And in that way, the LSDM learns how to predict um, trajectories into the future on a very detailed, geographically detailed level. Um, use case number five is uh, subtrajectory classification. And here I want to show you the example of uh, classifying trajectories um, to detect uh, a certain type of uh, vessel. Um, Chen et al, they use a CNNs also on AIS data, and they turn these AIS trajectories into images where each uh, pixel is colored according to the movement type of the vessel. So whether the vessel is static, maneuvering, or traveling uh, normally, and um, they use these images, as you can see below, uh, to train the CNN and perform the classification task. In this uh, subtrajectory classification, uh, other examples would also include like mode detection, so from a GPS trajectory or a smartphone tra uh, sensor trajectory, determine what kind of uh, movement mode was, uh, transport mode was used for a particular uh, travel segment. Um, the next use case that I want to talk about is next location or final destination prediction. Um, this is the category where we see a lot of check-in data from providers such as Foursquare or Govala and similar uh, providers that uh, uh, sell data for uh, users. And the example that I want to show you here is uh, using Foursquare data, uh, Foursquare check-ins, and they model the location sequences um, by converting them into sequence embeddings uh, using a causal embedding method. And then they can put this into a CNN layer, an attention layer, uh, to learn uh, how to predict the, the next location that a certain person, a certain user is going to visit. Um, this can also be applied to GPS tracks, for example, from taxis. In this case, the uh, Porto taxi tracks are converted into sequences of spatial embeddings that are then also put in the re into a recurring neural network to perform predictions of the next location that a taxi is going to visit. And different use case, the seventh use case is anomaly detection. And here the example I want to show you uses the approach of turning trajectories into a graph. So whenever there's a location where the trajectory changes direction, this location is turned into a graph node and the connections between the nodes are modeled as the edges. And um, this kind of representation is used in an RNN to detect anomalies in trajectory. 
Last but not least, uh, the last use case is synthetic data generation. So this is used when we want to share data, but we cannot share the original data. So we want to generate um, synthetic data that has the same characteristics as the original data set. And here the representation of the movement is, for example, origin destination flows between uh, locations um, like commuting flows between uh, statistical units and these origin destination matrices they can be synthetically generated to still have the same characteristics for example using an MLP model. We didn't just look into these use cases and uh, the tried to figure out which neural networks were involved into solving them. We also looked into the available implementations. Um, so here in this list, you can see all the implementations and the open source code that we found. Um, commonly, um, most of the um, papers with source code are one shots. So people are usually not maintaining or updating their source code. This makes it potentially harder for other people to, to reuse the code um, and build on already existing knowledge. So what are the results and the takeaway messages from uh, this review? In general, I think that mobility data engineering uh, is gaining more and more importance. We saw that there are a lot of um, similar pre-processing steps in different papers. So these pre-processing workflows can and should be standardized. With the rise of dedicated trajectory analysis libraries, such as Trek Intel, Moving Pandas, or Scikit Mobility, I think we are already on a good direction towards uh, having more standardized workflows that make the results more comparable and that make it more easy to describe exactly which pre-processing steps have been performed on a certain data set. On the neural network uh, research side, we expect an increase in popularity of graph neural networks. For example, for the data challenge where I showed you the traffic movie in the beginning of the presentation, uh, in the last iteration of this challenge, they changed from the traffic movies to a temporal graph representation that is supposed to be used by the participants of the challenge to train their prediction models, their forecasting models. In addition, we think that uh, neural networks uh, for mobility should increasingly be focusing on reproducibility and reusability of the results. So like I mentioned before, uh, when code is shared, uh, we should focus on making it really reusable to make it maintainable. Uh, the mobility data science community really lags behind the general computer science community here, where there are default um, benchmark methods, uh, baseline methods that are can be easily reapplied to other data sets uh, to have co means of comparing new work to existing work. So future research should certainly address uh, topics such as model transferability, benchmark availability, so both software as well as data. Um, the main reason why in our paper we are not uh, presenting any performance measures is that every paper uses a different data set. And even if they use the same data set, uh, they often do perform different uh, pre-processing steps. They define the challenge that they are trying to solve in a slightly different way. So it would really be comparing apples and oranges to just include the performance measures that are reported in a given paper. Uh, and that's why we decided against doing that. Finally, um, in mobility research, because it is so important for decision makers, also there should be more focus on model explainability and in avoiding black box models um, in future work. And with that, I want to thank you and I'm looking forward to your questions and in learning about your experiences with this kind of work. Thank you.